Hello and welcome back to the California Cannabis Report. I'm your host, Jared Schwass. We have an exciting episode for you today. We head up to Humboldt County and interview Craig Najedli, founder of Talking Trees, High Grade Distribution, and Satori Movement. We talk about the products that he's got growing up in the mountains up in Humboldt. We talk about his partnership with Space Gems. We talk about his, his products winning Emerald Cups. And we talk about the culture and the industry in a whole. We got, got a lot of good information for you in this episode. I hope you follow along. I hope you enjoy. I look forward to seeing your comments down below. Come on up with me to Humboldt County and see what's growing up in the mountains. Let's go. Craig Najedli from Talking Trees and Satori Movement. How you doing, Craig? I'm doing great. Thanks. Uh, hey, will you tell the people where we are for right now and kind of describe uh, where we're at? Yeah, right now we're in uh, northeastern Humboldt County up in uh, Willow Creek area um, out on one of the farms here of Talking Trees. Cool. Awesome. It's a beautiful place. And uh, you have multiple different areas. What area are we in right now on the farm? Uh, this has the name of the grandfather flat. So it kind of came with the property when I bought it from an older gentleman around here. He's like, he had all these different names for the different areas of the farm or the property. And so this is the grandfather flat. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah and we just went up to the, the, is it the top of the world top you called it? Top of the them? world. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful <laughs> place. It is a little, got a view of re, like the top of the world. View, yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's beautiful. Uh, so yeah, we give people a little bit of background of you, uh, talking trees and, of uh, Satori movement. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it kind of all started with Satori movement. Uh, it's like a hemp clothing company and skateboard company start, that I started in 1998. Um, so kind of in the hemp cannabis world since then, along with skateboarding and action sports. And then uh, just kind of been growing cannabis since like 99, 98 um, time frame and just kind of expanded over time. And then, uh, you know, with the expansion and coming, seeing that uh, legalization was coming, I uh, incorporated Talking Trees as a brand, Talking Trees Farms in 2015. And so kind of just started working towards legalization um, and getting permitted around 2015 for both indoor and outdoor cultivation. Awesome. In 96, were you up in uh, Humboldt? Uh, no, I came to Humboldt in 99. 99? Yeah. And yeah. That, is that, was that when you first started growing? Yeah. So I first started growing in San Francisco, actually, gotcha. around 90, like late 98, early 99. So a little, uh, you know, two lights set up in an apartment building <laughs> and didn't know if carbon, I don't even know if carbon filters were on the market back then. So just like really... Uh, you know, somewhat risky, but really fun, just growing a little too lighter and just getting dabbling in uh, growing and with a friend of mine that was kind of teaching me the way of uh, growing organic back then and had been growing for quite a few years before that. Mm. So kind of got in in the late 90s into growing and just kind of it's been a passion ever since. Yeah, well, what brought you up here in Mount Humboldt? Uh, well, it was funny, you know, skateboard, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, or outside of Atlanta, Georgia, mm -hmm. so... Uh, skateboarding brought me to California and then quickly kind of got into the cannabis uh, in San Francisco region and then just friends through skateboarding and from, that moved out here from uh, Athens, Georgia, kind of moved up to Humboldt for cannabis growing, kind of brought me up here. So, you know, skateboarding brought me to the West Coast and cannabis brought me to Humboldt. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, so, yeah, you started early, late 90s and growing um, and you said you were taught you brought the Talking Trees brand into the uh, legal legal rec I industry and market. So what uh, what kind of push you push you towards it? Do you see that just was the way to keep a brand going or what? Yeah, what pushed you into the regulated market? Well, 
kind of a, you know, the property that I had bought this property that we're on. There's two properties here, and uh, the property up top had actually been visited by what they called the wet team, which is like uh, a group of law enforcement agencies consisting of like Fish and Game, the Water Board, local authorities. And so the property had been visited the year prior uh, for like that type of inspection before there was actually canvas permitting. And so when I bought the property, I had to like take on like grading permitting and uh, kind of doing some retroactive um, engineering work. And so it's kind of like forced into the permitting um, scheme because all that stuff becomes what getting a canvas permit entails. And so by doing that, um, based on a you know wet team um, um, inspection, I kind of like had to jump into the permitting process somewhat early. And then, you know, just being in business since I was like in my young 20s with the skate and apparel business, I just saw that you know, there's an opportunity in going legal and then looking like, of course, Washington and Colorado were already ahead of us on on this. Um, so I'd seen that like, there's people thriving out there doing a business. So it's like, you know, just embrace it and go for it. And yeah. It, for it. Did you have any other uh, encounters with enforcement before the wet team came out here? Because you were growing since the late nineties. Have you had any other uh, run-ins with the, with the law enforcement? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been arrested twice on the highway. Um, you know, definitely one was profiling where, you know, driving from Humboldt down to the Bay Area and had out-of-state plates, and my buddy was driving, actually, and so kind of got arrested with, like, you know, relatively small amount, but in 1999, mm-hmm. having, like, three pounds in the car was definitely a no-no, so that was my first experience of, uh, you know, getting arrested for cannabis, and then uh, in 2004, got arrested in Orange County, um, just a little bit sloppy on the road, kind of deserved that one. <laughs> and uh, other than that, you know, just being up here growing before legalization, it's um, never got busted, but when the copter, when you hear the copters, you start running for cover and just, like, crossing your fingers and praying. And up here in Humboldt, you know, we had a really good grassroots community through mm-hmm. KMUD Radio and this thing called the Clemp Report. So, And then uh, the Lost Coast Outpost is another journalism um, that kind of, like, as soon as anyone saw law enforcement, it was reported. And so the community just kind of started looking out for each other. So, like, you would know where law enforcement was, like, mm-hmm. sighted at 7 a.m. <laughs> and so you'd, like, whew, they're down, like, way far from me today. But if you saw a helicopter, you'd turn on the radio or look at the Lost Coast Outpost online and, and just kind of, like, you know, just get ready, right? Yeah. And uh, luckily, I never got that land and chop. But, um, you know it's always been in the back of your head and you kind of still have PTSD about anytime you hear a helicopter flying by the farm. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine anytime you hear any helicopter, you, you, you kind of freak out this little flinch yeah, a little just bit. Like a little, even if I'm in the city <laughs> these days, I'm like, Oh, the helicopter. I was going to say, you'd be in trouble in the city. Yeah. Uh, cool. And, um, you, those, uh, networks and radio stations was those all run by people who lived up here and were growing as well or are they just part of the community who actually ran those and are do they still uh, are they still live today yeah i mean came out radio is like a foundation of mostly southern humboldt where it's based out of and like it's still a just community run and owned uh, operated radio station that's just kind of just mm. always kind of embraced and been part of like the cannabis culture for you know decades going back to like i think the 80s is when it was started so really good asset for the community over the decades of like not being legal and being a voice and eyes um, on what's happening and kind of looking out for the community that is cultivating. And then the Lost Coast Outpost, I think, is a newer kind of media outlet that's also local that was like a, is more digital and so uh, online basis. And so they all feed each other. Then you have Kim Kemp, who's also a local reporter. So between those three avenues of media, mm-hmm. they're always kind of cross reporting and if one gets the story, then the other ones report it, and just kind of, it's been, a, it's a good community network for, um, you know, pre-legalization. I can't say that I ever look at them too much these <laughs> days now that I'm like, I don't feel like I have much to worry about. Um, but back in the day, it was a super valuable asset. So you know, I still support them and sponsor like the KMUD Radio, and you know, value like what it has done to the community and should always be a part of the community. So, yeah. um, especially you know, with technology, you never you can't depend on it too much, but. The radio signal's probably going to always be there, so um, when shit hits the fan, you know, turn to KMUD radio. <laughs> it's going to be there. Uh, you, but you touched a little bit talking about culture. Uh, how do you think, uh, what's the cannabis culture to you, and how do you think it's progressed or degressed through uh, legalization of, of rec use? Right. Um, 
you know, tough question, I guess, in a way. I mean, it's so many different things to so many other pe to people. I mean, you would hope at the heart of it is just a love for the plant and the love for cannabis. Um, and I think that's kind of what initiated the whole movement up here in Humboldt is that, you know, people saw it as a way to live off grid, kind of get back to the earth and yet be a sustainable way of living. Um, and I think everyone back in the day, even though grows were much smaller, focused on like quality and care for the plant, yet selling it to, you know, make ends meet and have a, a livelihood. And, you know, over the decades even, even since like 2004 when the Cole Memo came out, I think it's kind of just like proliferated to a level of like, there's a lot more profit-minded people coming into the space, especially in the community where um, it's kind of been commercialized a great deal. You know, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but the intentions are different, right? And it was kind of a back to the earth, kind of sustainable style of cultivation where now it's kind of like, how big can we get and, and going bigger? Um, but with regulation, you know, it kind of brings all that in and you have to be somewhat environmentally sustainable because they're checking your water sources. They're checking, you know, generator usage and sites have to get up to par and roads have to get up to par. So even though it is getting more commercialized with regulation, it's actually improving like land use development in a way, which, you know, it sucks kind of as a property owner just because there's a lot of expense involved in it. But after that is done and your road's nicer and you enjoy driving up a, a nicer road versus a really bad road, um, you know, there's benefits to it. It just comes at a cost and the, you know, income potential from when it was illicit versus now that it's legal is definitely diminished. And it's, you know, almost like farming anything else, almost blue collar work, but we don't get the subsidies and we don't have access to conventional capital to grow our businesses. So uh, we're at a little bit of a down play compared to regular agriculture, mm -hmm. but, um, you know. And you get taxed. <laughs> taxed to no higher. end, yeah. yeah. I mean, the taxation, you know, I actually had to write uh, one of the CDFA people this morning about, you know, we have a exemplary site, uh, one of my sites on the coast, and so they want to come and bring the director of the CDFA and a politician to the site just to show them. And they're like, well, that's great. I'm glad we're exemplary, but like, this is more work for me to accommodate, <laughs> you know, on a weekend, bringing these guys in and exposing them to what we do. Mm. Um, and I appreciate, I don't think they'd appreciate a bill from your fear time either. <laughs> yeah, right. And, you know, I can't write a bill, you know, bill them for that. But, yeah. you know, the taxes are like the hardest part of it all. They just tax us to no end. Or it's like, it makes it hard to grow a business that is doing well and growing because you're just losing it all to taxes and permitting fees rather than be able to reinvest in your business. And you can't go to the bank and just get a, a loan to, to, you know, hey, my, my books look good. I'm making money. They're like, yeah, but you're cannabis and federal. We can't loan money. And so, um, you know, it's, it's all fucked up. But Yeah. Yeah. In the early days, I've had clients where they were getting hard money loans and they were getting 20 you know, 18, 20%. And oh, it's yeah. so like, that's where I, that's only, uh, you it's know, the that's the only place they can get the, that's the only yeah. place they can get money. <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh man. But yeah, so, uh, you know, getting capital, especially in the early days, uh, very difficult. And right, it is, it's hard right now, especially if you're not, if you're not big and have access to uh, certain financial avenues. Right, yeah, that's yeah. Um, So you, you know, you, as you mentioned, you got a fairly uh, good size grow up here. Um, how, Walk us through, you know, explains kind of the troubles or did you even have trouble? Do you think uh, licensing was tough, you know, because you did have to do some of that pre-permitting before, uh, you know, actually getting your cannabis license. Um, and But so did you have a difficulty get, getting that? Because up here, up here, people hear, uh, you know, a lot of stories of people having difficulty and up here, especially Mendocino. Um, so kind of walk through if you had any difficulty or if how do you how you find that found that process oh yeah i mean super difficult i mean other than just like the grading plans and all the other things involved like you know supposedly there's a spotted owl in this part of the woods around here <laughs> so you know that made it a huge issue with uh you know fish and wildlife and having to get reports for that and reports for the road and then the road has to be upgraded with these kind of drainage uh, aspects and so you know I have to spend mm. almost $50,000 a year just on the road just to, like, kind of keep the standards up. Um, 
and then like everything else involved between like having to get the spotted owl um, analysis done every year to make sure we're not like encroaching on its livelihood, even though there's hundreds of thousands of acres in national forest, um, you know, around us. And I don't think we're really making an impact on the spotted owl being that this plot's been here for over 10 years, but um, you know, we still faced with that. And so it's like, they just keep throwing things at you. And once you get over one thing, then a new thing comes. And so it's been extremely difficult, but you just got to persevere through it. And hopefully time it all out that like you can plan things around harvest times where you might have more income. And so I've been lucky to balance it all out in a ways where all these huge expenses kind of like revolved around harvest times. And, you know, you got 90 days once they uh, say you're, can get the permit to pay for it and so kind of being really strategic about like when cash flow is going to be there versus not there like you know what farmer has money in in june and july because you're putting everything into the new cultivation versus november when you're starting to harvest and um bring in some revenue so it's just a whole strategic plan to make it work and they don't make it easy. No, they don't, especially <laughs> when they change regulations. Or the very big, the first couple of years, it seems like every six months there was change in regulations. Yeah, and uh, on this plot where we're at right here today, it's kind of a mix match, like legacy pot, where there's this plot. I mean, where there's like a bunch of different levels, and it's just kind of like, kind of a mess in my view, like of how I would want the site. So actually, today we have, you know, we applied for a grading permit to kind of level it out and put like ten greenhouses all on the same level and kind of contain everything. And uh, so they're going to come do an initial inspection for that here just after this interview. And, um, you know, that took me, like, reaching out to the planning director and getting engineers involved to see, like, why it would be a good move from a land use perspective, not only to benefit my operation, but also, like, the quality of the property and the drainage and all those things. So it's like every change or move that you do in cultivation is, like, a big investment. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to really uh, throw the money in to get any results in the time and the politicking to get 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 anywhere yeah yeah and uh yeah people have been having trouble a lot and it's good for you for persevering through it because i feel you know once you, if you can get through it and make it through there is there's going to be light at the end of the tunnel it just ho yeah. hop, you know hopping through all those hurdles and going through that struggle um so let's get back to the brand talking trees uh can you kind of um, explain what that what talking trains means and explain the pro or you know the story yeah. of the brand totally yeah it's actually a pretty funny story it's like uh there's a spot up on the higher end of the property here and you know every plot has a name um so we had this one spot that was called extra credit it didn't get the most sun a little bit on the north facing side but um up w when you're in that area and there's you know there was we don't actually even grow there anymore but um you would be in that area and the, when the wind blows around four to five o'clock the wind gets really strong around mm -hmm. here and the trees would just start swaying back and forth and creaking and just like it gets really loud <laughs> and the trees are talking um and so i had an actually an employee that was you know working here and had to go to the local grocery store to open a charge account and when they asked her what the name should be she's like well how about talking trees and then she came back to me and was like, hey, I opened a, an account at the store and, and I called it Talking Trees. I was like, wow, it's an awesome name. That's that's going to be the name for the farm. <laughs> and so actually it was an employee, you know, back in 2015 that kind of came up with the name. And I was like, yeah, that's perfect. Let's run with that. And uh, so it's kind of just been, and I've always been like, you know, I was born on Earth Day. I've kind of always been like an Earth-minded type of individual. And so for me, like the trees do talk, everything in nature is cohesive and and one in a sense so you know the trees are talking and reading a book that a friend turned me on to called the secret life of plants is like that plants are like really in tune with like their ownership and really understand the vibration of like human connection and and communication there's all these scientific studies kind of proving that and so it just kind of reiterated why talking trees is a good name because you know the trees are talking the plants are talking and uh Hopefully we're going to make them say good things when you smoke them. <laughs> I've heard good things. Uh, yeah, no, and I 100% agree with you. There's, you know, I've uh, other cultivators that I've interviewed said, you know, they've explained multiple times that they 
the plant talks to them and they listen to the plant and that's what helps them you know uh produce such a good bud you know and then so yeah i i think it's a great name and it's it's, it's especially how it happened so uh spontaneous yeah that's amazing yeah it wasn't like sitting around the boardroom trying to come up with a name it was just like (laughs) this employee just happened to come up with the name i was like that's it we're going that's a good name and uh yeah, every plant is different. When you you know look at strains and learning how to grow with different strains, mm-hmm. and every strain needs a, has a different need in terms of when they want certain types of food and amounts of food, and um, so yeah, you got to pay attention. And all the plants will talk to you and, and kind of express their needs if you're really paying attention. And so I think growing is somewhat of a very intuitive process. You know, you know even for guys out here, you know I don't actually sit here and feed all the plants myself. It's like we can give you a regimen that's like, okay, here's our basic, but you're going to have to tweak it based on what we're growing and in the different strains. So there's like no one set way in this environment to be like, this is what we're feeding and this is what's going to work because every strain especially has a different need and you got to learn and pay attention to the strains and what they're telling you and what they want. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in addition to talking trees, the flowers that you make, you also uh, make space gems, the edibles. Yeah. You so, want to talk about that brand and what and the story behind that? Yeah, totally. So uh, my partner in Space Gem, Wendy, she she's the founder of Space Gem. She started that out of her kitchen in like 2013 in the legacy days. And, you know, her whole basis with that is a solventless bubble hash infused vegan gummy, um, which is still the only one on the market that is a... Uh, you know, bubble hash infused vegan gummy. I think there's other brands trying, but it just uh, creates such a better high than a distillate based um, oil extraction um, gummy. And so she started that brand and when his legalization came, she approached me about a providing her, you know, bubble hash material. Cause that's one of the things we do. Um, we're focused on all solventless extraction from the material from the farm. Um, so I never got into the volatile, you know, oils and, stuff like that. I just never saw that as my path, which is a good thing because it was a race to the bottom in that world. Mm -hmm. Um, So we stuck with, you know, just conventional good old bubble hash and teaming up with Wendy was a great, great move because, uh, you know, she's put in a lot of work and the brand's doing really well and, and, uh, you know, a couple hundred stores and just, it's definitely just the best gummy on the market. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm biased, I can still say (laughs) it is just because of the quality of the product. And so it's been really good, you know, working yeah. with her and I mean, her and I partnered up on the Space Gem project. And so, you know, Talking Trees and Space Gem are self-distributed through my distribution company, which is High Grade Distribution, mm-hmm. which was a company since 2004 from my legacy business of distributing skateboarding and hemp apparel around the, the world. Mm-hmm. And so with legalization, I kind of just flipped that name into a cannabis distribution business um, and just rolled with that. And so, yeah, we've been... That makes, a ni- that makes a nice transition if you already had the infrastructure already built. Yeah, so just, just, get a, just get a license. Traction, yeah, so. yeah, cool. So, yeah. That's good. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, the difference uh, difference of highs between the bubble hash edible and the distillate hel- uh, edible. Will you kind of just walk people through that difference and what they could expect from a bubble hash? Oh, yeah. So with the bubble hash, you're just going to get a more full spectrum, um, you know, I guess you could call it entourage effect. But with the distillate, you know, I mean, everyone said, it, you know, it's undeniable that it's just more of a refined um, ingredient that doesn't provide that full spectrum of cannabinoids. And, you know, the body recept, uh, receptors, you know, work with all the different cannabinoids in a full spectrum sense. And so when you're limiting the full spectrum, you're going to get a different effect from a distillate versus that full spectrum cannabinoid profiles that you're getting with the bubble hash. And so it's just a totally different effect. You know, most, most people, I've never met anyone that won't find them to be more potent. Um, so if you ate like a 10 milligram hash infused versus a 10 milligram distillate infused, you're going to get a, a better effect from the hash infused compared to the distillate mm-hmm. um, and a cleaner high just because it's not as refined. And I think that's just, you know. Yeah, less processed. And uh, yeah. yeah, the distillate just is pure THC. Well, you see, yeah, like you were mentioning, the bubble hash has that full cap cannabinoids, and they all interact with each other. So you were mentioning uh, some of the strains, or you you mentioned uh, that you know strains that Talking Trees was producing. Can you walk us through, introduce the people to some of those strains, some of your uh, you know uh, your OGs, the ones you've had consistently, and maybe some that you're working on right now. Yeah, I mean, we're always chasing the new strain 
fad, you know, I mean, you know, everyone was growing ice cream cakes last year and maybe into this year. And to me, I'm like, that's the new blue dream. It's going to be a fad. Everyone's going to be over it really quickly. And so here, we're, you know, we're trying to focus on always hunting out something new. So at any given time, beyond what's planted, we're always experimenting with like 60 to 100 new strains or say 60 strains with up to 100 phenotypes of those strains and just kind of trying to select um, what's going to be the next thing that we plant. So right now we have a bunch of different stuff that we've kind of pheno hunted over the last couple years that are um, from different seed breeders or maybe a couple mm -hmm. things that we've bred internally. We don't do too much breeding just yet, um, working on that program. And uh, so just always trying to find something new. And also, you know, just with the way the market is, even though I don't believe that's how cannabis should be brought, but we need to focus on the things that uh, test with the high THC potency just because that's where the consumer market is. And so even though we might find something that's really nice that we really like, we have to do the THC profile test because no matter how much we like it, you know, we have to sell it. And um, unfortunately, the consumer market and the, you know, retail market is driven by potency. Um, so we're trying to find things that have unique terp profiles. Um, and I think there's a trend going back to gases like OGs and sours were kind of lost in the last year or so. Everybody went to the cakes and the purples, and so I feel like there's going to be a trend going back towards uh, gassiness. You know, there's always the trends like back in the day, train wreck. Everybody loved it, and then everybody got tired of it, and then nobody has it. And so, you know, it's all about keeping things around for longevity's sake, but not, not necessarily growing them out and flowering, but just having a catalog and a library of strains. And so, you know, I have over 100 plus strains in our catalog or library that we determine whether we're going to grow or not and uh you know one of the most consistent ones is just the good old skittles you know i got a great skittles cut um probably five six years ago and it's just an amazing skittles cut that you know one of my favorite things to smoke um and then we worked with you know some local breeders uh, booney acres is doing really good work we're actually running three or four of their different phenotypes from one of their seed crosses that we hunted out and uh won some awards with so um yeah, it's just a continual hunt to try and evolve. There's nothing that we could say, we're growing these strains for the next five years because I don't think the market wants that. The market wants something new. Uh, there's maybe a couple staples in that, like Skittles, Lemon Royale is a really good one that we're growing. It has the lemon terps, really high potency, and um, garlic cookies, another one that hits about 30% THC usually. So those are like maybe our, we'll, we'll keep a few strains more around for more than one year or two. Um, other than that, we're kind of always just trying to, figure out the next new strain that we can cultivate. Awesome. And so when you're, uh, when you are pheno hunting and looking for new strains other than, um, you know, the marketization of it, what are you looking for uh, when you are trying to f bring another uh, strain into your, uh, your library? Yeah, I mean, terpenes are big for us. You know, we test all our smokable products for terpenes. So, you know, it's just kind of like this big ocean of information that we're, everyone's trying to sort and kind of understand so we we test everything for terpenes just kind of get an understanding of like what the full effect of the plant is so that'd be our second biggest criteria that we look at when we're um you know looking at new strains is like how did it test what are the terpenes looking like how is the yield how's the look of the bud so you know those are probably like the four main things we look at when we're determining what strains to grow mm -hmm. um and part of that terpene profile, like, you know, 10 years ago, I had no idea what terpenes were. It's like, just open the bag. How does it smell? How does it look? You know, that's kind of when you get down to the basics of it, it's just the same as it ever was. Like, what's that bag appeal like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What, what does it smell like when it hits my nose? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's what the terpenes and, Yeah, exactly. No one no one ever said, oh, let me see these. Let me see what kind of terpenes these things have. Yeah. But it's very fascinating. You know, there's all it these is. terpenes and there's new types of uh, cannabinoids, you know, THV, THC, you know, there's there's so many different cannabinoids that, mm -hmm. um, attributing some with being able to help sleep, CBN, and um, so it's super fascinating that science is kind of getting more involved in helping us as growers that, like, I'm not a scientist, I just know how to grow a plant, uh, understand all the aspects of the cannabis plant, which is cool. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm super excited for science to keep on diving into uh, the effects of each different type of terp and how each terp and cannabinoid interplays with each other and so yeah. that we can really figure out like, you know then you can figure out this strain produces this kind of effect 
because science was so uh, it was prohibited for decades and so it's playing catch up and i'm just really fascinated by see what science produces in the next couple of years yeah it's gonna be very interesting up top i saw that you have some mixed light here we have an outdoor it looks like you do some light light depth mm -hmm. uh it could explain uh or walk the people through your the growing process of talking trees maybe why you do some uh mixed light some light depth and you know kind of go walk, walk through that process yeah so i mean out here in humboldt it's kind of with what you had is what you got when legalization happened so ironically the more illegal you were the bigger your grow was the more you got rewarded in terms of going legal um, so on this side where we're at right now, it was kind of a mix of all these trenches and these full season holes. Um, and so with the state versus the county, there's different permitting types. So even though we have these hoops for light depth in the county, since there's no lights in them, they're considered outdoor versus with the state, anything that has a hoop or a cover over it is automatically considered mixed light. Um, but in an ideal world, we'd have, you know, greenhouses everywhere because we could get multiple runs, two to three runs, even without lighting in those and it would just be um, increases your production um, that little bit of cover you know if you're looking for a more indoor look it's all about limiting a little bit of the the, the sun's exposure because if you get too much sun it'll uh, uh, usually produce a more you know brown or darker bud versus uh, you know covering it greenhouse um, even shade cloth when it's really hot and on this kind of area in the last few weeks preserves the turps gives it more of that you know refined indoor look so with this site and the inspection today is we're actually planning on grading it and taking all these hoops in the full season out of here and converting it to, uh, you know, mixed like greenhouses. And the only reason why the county would let me do that, because this is a TPZ property and you can't change what was already permitted, is that we couldn't disturb anything outside of what's already disturbed. So they're allowing us to kind of make some changes, but we can't, you know, grade anywhere that already hasn't been disturbed. Mm -hmm. So... Um, It'll be a great, you know, um, next step for this site to be able to transition this all into like one flat that's easier to take care of from a farming perspective. We'll control runoff, better for land use management as well. Um, so it's kind of a win for us and a win for the county from the land use perspective. So ultimately, you know, greenhouse is, is where I'd like to be for everything, um, just because the best way to maximize production. And uh, do you? There's a lot of some people have concern with uh, use of indoor and even mixed light because you're using, you know, electricity, fans, lights, and whatnot. Um, do you what kind of sustainability uh, pr pro protocols have you used in this farm uh, to kind of keep it sustainable? Yeah, well, here we're off grid, so I mean, <laughs> we're inherently <laughs> kind of forced into the sustainability <laughs> factor. Yeah, uh, you know, up top, we do run a 70 kW generator. I mean, honestly, I, I think it's more sustainable than using PG&E. I mean, you know, when you have it set up properly and, you know, the tank storage and, the, um, you know, maintain your generators, um, keep them clean, oil changes, you know, when you maintain things properly, there's not necessarily wrong with power usage. Um, I mean, you do have to, you know, buy diesel and you're using diesel. It's not ideal, but every business requires power. I mean, it doesn't matter what you're doing. And so... You know, trying to offset and use as less power as that. So, like, even on like mixed light environments, um, we have them set up on automated controllers that, like, mm -hmm. if the par meeting of the natural sun is strong enough, it automatically mm -hmm. turn the lights off. So, just trying to maintain as much efficiencies as possible, but knowing that you know we can only be as sustainable as possible to make the quality of the product that we want to make. Um, you know, it's always a balance. Yeah, and uh, water seems to be going to be tight up here uh, in all of California and all of, all of the West Coast. Yeah. Uh, and I saw that you do some uh, rain catch and well. Yeah. Uh, is that, those are your two water sources up here? Yeah, those are the only two water sources we have up here. So we have a, a half-acre uh, rain catchment pond that we you know store up water from the rainfall of the winter and then access to three ground wells. Um, so, you know, we're not dry draining any creeks or rivers um don't have municipal water available here i did have access to drain water from a creek mm -hmm. here but you know with the rain catchment in the wells we just don't need to do that at all so we just pulled that out um even though i had to get it permitted with the 1600 from the cdfw uh just because it was there um so yeah we try to be as sustainable on the water usage as possible um with growing in the beds and even in the greenhouses helps manage the water through the th drip systems versus the full sun outdoor will definitely require more water, you know, per square footage. Um, Cause you're growing bigger plants, they take more water.
versus if you have a, a nice bed with a lot of different plants that where you can kind of spread that water usage and some will drink a little bit more than others um, just based on you know their size because they're not always going to be perfectly the same size um, so you know with beds drip irrigation trying to conserve and catch as much uh, you know reclaimed water as possible is you know is how we try to operate here yeah good um, and um some people you were talking about earlier, going back to the, you know, the, your grow procedures and process, you mentioned you were talking about runs and how you're trying to officiate, uh, get efficient production. Uh, walk some people, some people may not know, a run is a full cycle of a plant yeah. uh, from seed to, to uh, bud and, cut and harvest. Um, so we kind of just walk people through the difference between a mixed light grow and that cycle and then kind of the cycle out here with the hoop houses and full cycle and explain kind of the difference totally yeah so we mostly grow from clone um if we're if, we, if we're popping seed it's more of a r&d kind of pheno hunting because if we popped a hundred of the same seeds out here we might wind up with a hundred different types of looking uh phenotypes from that seed even though it was all the same strain so, you know, when you're looking at um, production cultivation, which, you know, what we're doing is producing more than we're going to smoke ourselves, <laughs> uh, we would need to find some uniformity. So if we're popping seeds, it's more of an R&D thing where we'll flower them out and kind of search out phenotypes and then produce enough clones of those. And I have a nursery on the coast. So the nursery will produce clones, and then we figure out how many clones are needed for, say, this these beds. When you're doing a mixed light or light depth, you're going to use a lot more plants than if you're just growing one big full season plant. Um, but once you plant the clones, um, which a clone, when getting planted into a bed, will have to go into like either a four inch or a quart gallon size of soil just to kind of acclimate and what you call harden off a little bit, get used to the environment and this, the heat and being outdoor. So from a clone, it takes, you know, you'll cut the clone off of a mother plant. That takes, you know, two to three weeks to root before you have strong enough roots to plant that into a little bit of dirt. Um, and then you go into that quart size or a, you know three inch pot size, probably let it stay in there for about a week or two. So you're about five weeks to getting them planted into these hoops. And then about another week or two um, for you know vegging up to you have a, a nice canopy where the leaves of the different plants are touching each other. Once you see that, you control in the light depth, um, the light cycle by pulling tarps over them because the plants need like at least a 13 hour light cycle uh, to flower. Everyone, you know, goes by 12, 12. So um, you start pulling tarps on them. So there's a 12 hour of darkness, even though the days are getting longer and natural light's getting um, longer. That's why you got to pull the tarp to control the darkness. And then once you pull the tarps, that's when you continue, when you start the flowering process, that's be depending on what strain you're growing, you're looking at eight to nine weeks before you can harvest it. Um, so that whole process takes, you know, give or take a three-month cycle mm -hmm. from start to finish product. Yeah, and that's compared to, so if you're just doing a full outdoor, full cycle grow, how long would that take? Well, full cycle outdoor would take, you know, if you planted a plant without natural light, you have to plant it around, you know, early to mid-June mm -hmm. um, so that it doesn't revert and actually start flowering too early because the, the light cycle is getting longer. Um, and of course the most light is in June 21st, you know, the solstice. So planting just like a couple of weeks before that, um, you'd have to grow a bigger plant. You'd want to have a pretty big plant once you plant it because it'll naturally start flowering with the light cycle, um, in early August. And so then depending on the strain, uh, full season of the plant, you would usually harvest around the first week of October or sometime in October. There are some strains that finish in late September. There's some fit strains that could go through to November. So, you know, you got to kind of figure out what strains work for where you're at in your environment because the weather can change pretty drastically uh, in October, November. So you're, you're more committed with a bigger plant um, per square footage when you have to do full season outdoor. Mm -hmm. uh, the cycle takes longer and you're only able to get one pull off that, you know, plot mm -hmm. um, a year versus... With the light depth, you can get two, maybe three. I also wanted to talk about uh, the, in, the area as a whole. Where do you see the future of Humboldt cannabis farmers going? Uh, and then also, where do you see the future of talking trees going? Yeah. Um, well, with Humboldt, I think 
it's always gonna have a place, you know, it's historically very well known for growing and when you're going to the East Coast and stuff like that, like, oh, you say Humboldt, you know, it, it means something. I think that's kind of diminishing, unfortunately, for the community here because there's so many brands and so much more cannabis hit in the market in LA that like, they're looking at marketing versus like the Humboldt name. Um, but even like the local government's trying to get a marketing campaign and looking at Appalachians um, to try and help promote that so that there is a viable um, namesake with where the cannabis is grown. But I don't really see that so much driving consumer market at the point at this moment. But uh, in terms of like Humboldt, you know, it's pretty, I guess, relatively good for cultivation compared to other municipalities. Um, you know, they were the first to start permitting cannabis farms in the state. And overall, they have a somewhat, not I wouldn't say easy is not the right word, but, um, you know, it's not as painstaking as other municipalities to get permitted. And I think the main thing with that going to keep uh, Humboldt thriving is that, you know, only cultivation is taxed in Humboldt. So, like, the manufacturing, the distribution, and the retail aren't taxed. And, and a lot of municipalities are charging um, percentages based on gross revenue. And in Humboldt, they charge per square footage per year. So that's going to always be a way better model than a uh, percentage of gross revenue. And so from a financial standpoint, um, Humboldt's going to be a good place to grow. And then with talking trees moving forward, you know, we're just always looking at expanding, trying to get the product into more stores around the state, um, new product SKUs, you know, and packaged goods, um, just introducing like a two pack of pre-rolls next month and kind of looking at new things, kind of staying within the lane of the products that we're already uh, producing, focused on flour, pre-rolls, bubble hash, um, and high-end live rosin extracts through a brand we're partnering with called Have Hash. Um, and then like with Space Gems, you know, some of our bubble hash goes to that. So just kind of keep growing with those avenues and producing more quality flour that more consumers can appreciate because I think uh, consumer demand in retail outlets are just going to keep increasing. Um, even though it's pretty sad that California in a whole has less than a thousand retailers uh, for the basis of the state. I think Oklahoma has like more than 1,300 mm -hmm. already. So, you know, consumer access is extremely limited. And as that opens up more, you know, more and more people will probably start buying packaged consumer cannabis. And so Talking Trees just helps to continue growing, um, you know, sales of the brand and our flower, you know, everything with Talking Trees that if it says Talking Trees on it, it was grown by us, you know, we don't do any white label. So um, it's all single source cannabis. You know, a lot of the brands out there are like buying from multiple farms and there might be some inconsistency. You know, we take responsibility for everything we put in a package because we grew it. And that's, you know, pretty unique so far, I think, in the cannabis industry in California. There's not too many single source um, brands out there. Yeah, I think there's, I think that's small, a small group of, of you guys are doing it, which yeah. I think it's good. I think it's smart. So do you, I know a lot of uh, cultivators, um, they, the, the cultivators, they sell bulk. And then there's also a lot of brands that buy from smaller uh, cultivators and package under their brand. Uh, is that anything that Talking Trees is, any, any Talking Trees do any of those models? Uh, no, I mean, with Talking Trees, you know, I think we're one of the few brands in the market in California that's actually 100% single source. So anything we package in a Talking Trees, you know, branded um, box or package is grown by Talking Trees. So, uh, you know, we're just scaling cultivation as we grow our sales. And so kind of just expanding cultivation, picking up licenses as needed. But at the moment and for the future, you know, anytime you see a Talking Trees product, you'll know it was grown by Talking Trees and we can stand by behind the quality and and or maybe not the quality, you know, every, every once in a while you don't have a good run. <laughs> but in those cases, we always price it, you know, per what the quality is. But, um, yeah, we, we grow everything we put our name on. And um, I think that's pretty rare in the state overall for brands that are growing. I think so, too. And do you guys sell bulk at all? Um, very little. You know, right now, especially with COVID last year, we probably produced more than we sold in packaged goods. So about maybe 10 to 15 percent we did sell in bulk to mm -hmm. uh other you know brands or distributors that that needed it just to kind of keep our margin of you know when a new production was coming new harvest coming versus what we had in stock because you know we always want to be as fresh as possible um as fresh as possible means about like you know 30 to 60 days out from harvest is probably when you're going to get like prime like cured 
best, you know, um, taste of the flower. So, you know, you don't want it too fresh because it hasn't cured out and, um, you know, ripened, so to speak. But um, we also don't want to put flower out that's like six months old either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, um, as of right now, what, what, kind, what strains can people look for and, look, and go, go get right now that are out in the market? Uh, yeah. Well, right now we're, it's kind of a, in the in-between phase, you know, we, <laughs> yeah. have a, we have a lot of strains on the menu. I couldn't even name them all. There's probably about 20 right now, mm -hmm. but we're actually moving into like a new whole packaging, um, change up. We're going from jars and pop tops to compostable mylar for most of our packaging, um, which will like save a lot of space from our manufacturing standpoint, because it'll be, you know, a lot of pressed bags versus bulky jars and, and pop tops. Um, so we're kind of streamlining and trying to, you know, sustainableize the packaging a little bit more over the next month. So right now we're kind of flushing out our inventory to revamp the line with like kind of a new look and new packaging when all this fresh harvest starts coming in next month. Mm -hmm. Um, so people know when they got the fresh stuff, it'll be the new it'll fresh, be the new packaging. New packaging. Yeah. There yeah. you go. <laughs> but we still have some fresh stuff coming out right now because we do the mix light in the indoor. Yeah. Um, but we are transitioning into new packaging that'll hit by August 1st. And um, so that's when like our fresh harvest and our new strains will start hitting. But on our menu at any given time, we have about like 15 plus different strains. What do you, you anything you want to excite, you're excited about that you've tried or, you know, something new that you guys are releasing that you're really excited about that you want to tell people about? Yeah, well, we have the strain growing actually out here right now that'll be coming in August. Uh, the Smashers, Smashers, it's a, I can't always remember, I'm pretty bad with names. If, if Strains were numbers, I'd be really good at it. But, <laughs> um, but we have three different phenos, Smashers, Zerps, and um, squeeze -its. And so mm -hmm. all those are like the same uh, strain seed, but very different profiles when we, uh, you know, phenotyped them. Mm -hmm. And that was a Booney Acres cross that we've gotten um, from their seeds. And uh, pretty exciting. Yeah. High testing, really nice terps, you know, with the Skittles in there. Um, we have a guava Skittles that's looking really good that we tested out. That's going to be coming. Um, of course, the Skittles in general we're going to be putting out and uh, looking at, you know, some different cakes. You know, we have a really good wedding cake, but, you know, I think people are getting, getting you know, a little over the wedding cake. So mm. um, we're excited about all these Z strains we got coming and uh, a few other little surprises, you know, maybe a high CBD strain that we're looking at, um, a Ringo's Gift times Mimosa that tests really high CBD and, um, we've seen a little demand, pretty substantial demand for just like straight CBD flour. So that'll be a, a nice, unique one in the marketplace. Yeah, I think the market's getting, I think that's market's growing for the CBD flowers and uh, yeah. especially like, you know, one, one to one, three to one combos or one to three combos. Um, and then you, Talking Trees won the Emerald Cup and I know 2019 you won for their pre-roll. Uh, did you, uh, wh what was in the pre-roll uh, and did uh, did you how did how did the 2020 or 2020 uh emerald cup go for you yeah so pretty you know funny you know 2019 we won best pre-roll it was the first year that was a category and really we just entered what we had in queue because it had to be compliance tested it wasn't like a big strategy to enter you know this one thing and, oh man what strain was it i want to say it was our pink lemonade i'm not 100 percent sure because i'm really about names but yeah so we did one first place pre-roll in 2019 and then in the 2020 we didn't place in the pre-roll category we entered some but we got ninth place indoor which is another first time category and um you know getting ninth place for the indoor category was is quite an achievement you know mm -hmm. um we're pretty stoked on that um there was over 60 entries in that so that was a pretty good accolade getting ninth place there yeah. um space gem got a second place and a third place in edibles with the cbd and uh cbd gummies and then the other gummies so we did pretty well in uh, 2020 in the Emerald Cup. Cool, yeah. awesome, and yeah, you. Uh, I know it, the Emerald Cup's not. They're not doing it in Santa Rosa anymore. Are they going? Are you still planning on uh, joining them down in LA? Yeah, for sure. I think it'll be great in LA. I think they're doing both. Uh, pretty sure they're going to do a smaller scale um, event in December in Santa Rosa still, and then another event in SoCal. Oh, um, really? March or April. I'm not sure of the date, but yeah, they're going to do both. Awesome. I, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. I was kind yeah. of bummed that they were moving out of NorCal. Yeah, you can't move completely out of NorCal because that's where it <laughs> came from. And, you know, personally, I've been at every Emerald Cup since day one. You know, when I, I took my clothing, my hemp clothing company there back when it was at Area 101. And, 
you know, it was just a stormy mess every year. It was just outside. It was raining in December up in Humboldt or in Leightonville, outside of Leightonville. Um, but it's been really amazing to see what Tim and Taylor have done with that event from the super humble beginnings at Area 101 where it's just in the rain and just like a really tight-knit um, event to like what it's grown to be since it went to Santa Rosa and like just a world-renowned, you know, best cup, you know, best judges, like really the only cup that I think means something substantial in cannabis is that like they're all about just getting the best judges and in, in, in testing and really thoroughly having a good judgment on, on the quality of the products that they are judging. So, um, yeah, we're going to always try and be a part of it and hope that we can take some, you know, take some wins home. But it's a tough competition. There's a lot of good, a lot of good product and a lot of good cultivators out there entering product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of good, especially, you know, up here. And But you're, you're, you know, keep on ended up in the top. So good congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Um, so where can people find Talking Tree Space Gems uh, throughout California? Yeah, throughout California. I mean, we're, we're pretty well diversified all around the state. You know, we have retailers all around the state. Um, you know, Humboldt, we're really strong in. I have a store in McKinleyville at Satori Wellness that carries all our products. But, um, you know, all the way down to San Diego, out to California City, close to Nevada, around L.A., the Bay Area. You know, we're in a little, about 200 stores, so um, we're pretty, the product's pretty accessible. Yeah. Keep your eyes out for talking trees and yeah, space gems. Um, anything else you want to let people know that you got going on? Um, man, just just always growing. You know, that's what we say is we're just always growing, trying to keep it keep it going. Yeah, uh, and it seems like you've been doing a great job of doing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, all challenges aside, you know, it's it's still fun. You know, it's still a passion. Love love seeing the plants grow, and um, yeah, just uh, always moving forward. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you so much for having me up here. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming out. It's a pleasure to have you out here. Appreciate that. Thank you. Awesome.